Support for this episode is provided by listeners like you. If you'd like to be a part of the great people keeping this show going, please visit thelinecast.com slash donate. Welcome to The Linecast. I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. In this episode, we are joined by singer-songwriter Joy Ike. It's been nearly three years since Joy Ike's first appearance in The Linecast, and we take some time to talk about some of her accomplishments she's made in the time since. It was just like, it was just one of the most incredible experiences that I'd ever had um, at that point in my life, and getting to just meet some people whose music, music I listened to as a kid and talk to them about the music industry and what it means to kind of be a female in, in a male-dominated industry and what it means to kind of do that full-time and what it might look like in the future. So um, that was a really cool experience, and um, I actually got to do that event with my band, so um, that was just, uh, it was just a great a great day for us. Joy has a new album entitled All or Nothing. She talks to us a little bit about the creative process behind that album. There was so much that I wanted for this album that I really needed to sit on it and wait for um, the right people to work with, as in a a producer to work with. Um, So I was kind of shopping around for um, someone who understood my type of music and had worked with other artists that I had worked with um, that other artists that I listened to and like um, and knew kind of where I was coming from or the vision I had for this album could kind of help me make it happen. So uh, it really just required sitting and waiting just for the right time and the right person to work with. Enjoy the conversation. Well, Joy, welcome back to the Lancast. Well, thanks for having me. So... It's been about three years since you've been on the Landcast, and that predates me. And so I know most of our listeners probably have an idea of how you got into music, but if you could just give me just a quick sum up of how how you got started in music. Uh, Well, I I feel like I've been around music all my life, you know, just my my, my family is a very musical family. Um, And some of my earliest memories are of, you know, singing choruses with my family and singing at the nursing home. Uh, My dad would drag my sister and I there every every Saturday. So it's kind of always been around. Uh, But I never really did or really took music seriously up until uh, my final year in college or so. You know, I was taking piano piano lessons as a kid and stopped for um, about eight years in high school and in college. Um, And there was just something that in me that really wanted to be a songwriter. And uh, I just there was something in me that just really wanted to be a writer, you know, and not necessarily a musician, didn't really care so much about playing piano. Um, But to me, at a certain point, I felt like piano was a tool that would help me to write. And um, those are kind of the, my earliest moments of really rediscovering music and playing and writing music. And then um, over the past eight years, it's kind of just been a constant presence in my life and a, um, a significant part of my life. Let's talk about the the jump to full time music. Mm-hmm. Uh, just real quickly, how how did you make that jump? What were the feelings going through at that time? Uh, well, yeah, it's been about four and a half years now that I've been uh, living this music journey, and I guess it's always how I always describe it because it definitely feels like a journey with a lot of bumps in it. <laughs> and um, I uh, was working this really great job, and I really loved it. Um, but it was the job itself was you know a nine to fiver and coming home at night I would spend time working on my music trying to find ways to promote it and it just became all consuming in every single way and I just felt like I wasn't getting any sleep Uh, and at the same time my passion for music was just growing Um, and so this one day I just uh, there were so many other things going on and I may have shared last time but um, my oldest brother Um, had been battling cancer for about four years at the time and um, and he passed away and uh, that was probably that that for sure was the catalyst for me uh, and the defining moment where I was just like I do not want to be spending my life behind a desk you know doing something that I'm not 100% passionate about so um, that and a number of other things you know just were kind of what made made me make that decision to launch into music full-time well, well, now I, I, something I want to ask you about is, is 
you you've kind of found like a second home here <laughs> in Lancaster, and it's it's some people that I've talked to they're like, oh, isn't she from around here? And I'm like, no, she's from Pittsburgh. <laughs> she just is here all the time. So, how did you grow that fan base in this area? And I'd like to think that it was because you came on the Lancaster. <laughs> <laughs> It is just so interesting because every time I tell my friends, you know, they're like, where are you going? I'm just like, Lancaster. And they're just like, what's in Lancaster? Because everyone knows of the Amish, you know, the Amish, Amish culture in Lancaster. And I tell them you know, it's a very, very rich Amish culture. And at the same time, it's a very vibrant art scene that I think sometimes people um, don't know about. And it's probably one of Lancaster's hidden treasures. Um, and so... The first time I came to Lancaster was with three other friends. We were, there were four of us were doing, um, a 10 day tour. We were mostly doing it, uh, through the Northeast. Um, and I came to Lancaster with, um, a good friend, Hiram Ring. And, uh, from that point on, like that was my first exposure to Lancaster. And I fell in love, I just fell in love with the city. And so I tried to come back as often as possible. And the second time I came back was the launch conference at the convention center. And that's when I met you guys and came on and did the show. But, um, like Lancaster for me just hasn't lost its charm at all. And, um, after having come, coming, ha having come back so much, you know, I've gotten a chance to just connect with people and meet some really cool quality people. And, um, and I think that's definitely the reason why I'm always back. So since the last time you've been on the show, apparently there has been um, some media uh, accomplishments for you. You've 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 made it on to some TV shows and um, some morning shows, and and even uh, you played the venue, the World Cafe. Where how did you get about doing these these shows or these these interviews? Uh, well, each time I hit the road, or I should say, in advance to hitting the road, um, my goal is and my hope is to be able to. Um, reach a new audience, you know, not to, not to be continually playing for the same people, but, um, try and always grow, um, grow my fan base and be able to play for new ears. Um, so before heading out into a new city or heading out to a city that I've been to over and over again, always trying to find, um, new media opportunities to kind of help shine a light on the shows that are kind of, are on the, you know, on the verge of happening. Um, so, I just, uh, I think the one, of the job that I was working earlier was as a publicist. Um, and I just love publicity and I love marketing and PR and all of those things. So one of the things that I, I geek out about is whenever I'm going to a new city, finding, um, new radio shows, television shows, podcasts, um, you know, publications to, to email and be like, Hey, why don't you have me on your show? I'm pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, and sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Do you, um, do you word it exactly like that? Just like is that, that. Is that how you, that what you did to David when you got here? You got pretty here. much. <laughs> <laughs> kind of cool. I'm kind of yeah. cool. Yeah. On the show. Yeah. Kind of cool is better than the lame. We know <laughs> Well, we're kind of lame. So kind of cool might be good for us. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let's go for it. We can take her word for it. We've never heard her before. <laughs> Hilarious. No, yeah, so it's it's always fun to be like, okay, who's going to get back to me? Who's not going to get back to me? Sometimes it's exciting and sometimes it's discouraging. But uh, So you just kind of go out there and just sort of like you figure the attitude of, you know, doesn't hurt to ask. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the worst thing that they can do is say no, you know, right. and that's, and that's the greatest And then you're just where you are. It, it doesn't yeah. really change your position anywhere. So. True, yeah. <laughs> so, um I, I write this, like, this marketing blog, this music marketing blog called grassrootsy.com. And, um, that was a shameless plug, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we but, can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> grassrootsy what? Grassrootsy what? We, Tommy Huff? Yeah, we, I love it. We, we can edit that out. Unless, unless she's going to pay advertising. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can work something out. We'll, we'll talk about we'll that. We'll figure it out. That's funny. Yeah. But yeah, so like, I always have artists ask, email me. I have this segment called Ask Grassrootsy. And they're just like, how do you do this? And how do you do that? And I'm just like, you just do it. You know, if you want to ask, if you want to play this venue, just email them and be like, can I play your venue? You, you know, um, and the worst they can say is no, you can't, you know, or you got to wait a couple more years until you have a strong enough draw or, you know, whatever. But um, I think the the greatest advantage uh, an artist has is just like their audacity to like dare to ask, you know, mm -hmm. the questions that some people just aren't aren't like uh, bold enough to ask. So. 
So along those lines, one of the things that I always talk about behind the scenes with Keith is I'm like, man, musicians are so pushy. Mm -hmm. like if, That's like, so funny. I'm like, if we wanted, we could just do a music podcast. Ah. <laughs> it's like, I, those are the people that are constantly coming out and just being like, oh, and it's it's just like, get something behind you before ah. you talk to me, you know. So okay, how do you? Well, you've, you have a following now, but when you were when you were getting going, how did you fluff up yourself enough to uh, make an impression? You know, people ask that ask me that a lot, and um. Aside from me telling artists that you just need to be bold enough to ask, um, the second thing I tell people is that you need to, you need to frame and craft your words in a way that people actually want to read them. And you can't send a pitch letter. Like I'll get emails for grassrootsy and people like, will you write about my music? And I'm just like, no, I will not. Because first of all, you didn't send me a link to your website. Second of all, you didn't give me a short bio, but you wrote this whole page that I don't want to read because I don't really know anything about you yet. You know, I want something short and sweet that's kind of like a teaser so that I want to know more. But I think sometimes artists just don't know how to pitch themselves well. And I'm not, definitely not going to get on a soapbox. I might have to actually stop there. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, I just tell uh, people, it's just like, you just really got to find a way to craft your words well and um, not ask like you deserve it. You know, ask like... Um, Almost like you're um, putting yourself in a humble position because nobody owes you anything. You know, you have to work to get to where you are. And I think that that's, that's um, probably one of the most beautiful things about pursuing whatever it is that you're pursuing in life. You know, it's, it's sweet when you get there, um, but it does take a lot of work. I, just, I was talking with this guy who's in band, uh, or he, I think he works for a record company, like a smaller record company. And it, people are, bands are constantly sending him CDs and he said the the one pitch that he got was the greatest pitch ever never had any didn't have any words didn't have anything written it was a CD with a photograph of the band bowing down to a pile of Paps Blue Ribbon beards and he said he said it was so hilarious. He opened CD, popped it right in the player. Ah, <laughs> see, and it so, was unique, you know, it right, was different. Yeah, yeah, so. so I heard this quote somewhere it was like you can either be really good and there are a lot of really good people but not a lot of really good people right. or you can be really bad which sometimes that's to your advantage like you know Gangnam style I just yeah. watched the video for the first time yesterday <laughs> What? How did <laughs> yeah. you avoid that? I don't know but then I saw another video of a baby dancing to the to that song and so I was like okay cool now I know I have some like context <laughs> <laughs> But so yeah you can either be really good or really bad or you can be different and I think that's like one of the great disadvantages you could have wow i you just saw gangnam style <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're still on it you're still still like, yeah. wow gangnam i still haven't seen it you haven't seen it no i haven't <laughs> i know the song i've seen like parodies of it and other people doing it yeah. and but, but i've never actually watched the original video you want to be my new host? <laughs> <laughs> I had to leave for an undisclosed reason. <laughs> okay, but now you're paying rent for my garage. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, so getting back to what we were talking about, about you playing new new places and venues and stuff and, and kind of really making a name for yourself. What are the things now, after after doing this for eight years, that still get you nervous to sit down is it is it when you sit down in front of the cameras for TV is it like larger conference con concerts or conferences or what kind of things really push your limits hmm <laughs> yes okay that's a good question um one of the things that always makes me nervous is um anything that's going to be recorded uh and not even necessarily uh, a podcast or something, but uh, being on like a television show or, oh yeah, even like anything that's recorded, yeah, anything's fair game. Um, that that like feeling of it being in permanence like is so nerve-wracking for me that I, that I just get, sometimes I get really uptight before I'm heading into a studio for an interview. Um, I get really nervous, I've found still, whenever I'm playing in really large rooms. Um I love I, I love intimate audiences. Like I love really small audiences, um, more more or less because it makes me feel like I'm at home. You know, I'm very comfortable, and I feel like that kind of reflects on my personality a little bit. Um, but it's really hard to connect with an audience when they're really large. And I think whenever I have a hard time connecting with the audience, I just feel like I'm not really there. 
Um, so it's probably less of a nervous thing, but less of a just not feeling like myself. Um, so I think those are probably the two, uh, two instances where I'm just like, it just never really seems to click like I want it to. Do you feel less satisfied after those types of things? Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I was, uh, doing some interview somewhere and I told people, you know, I'd rather drive two and three or two or three hours and play for a room of 50 people, um, that are listening, you know, really listening than play for a room of 500 people where, you, you don't know who's listening because there could be any number of things happening um, at the same time. So I really love um, intimate audiences. And I don't want to, you know, try and uh, say that, you know, I don't want to play for those big audiences because I, I, I do want to be able to play for anyone who wants to listen. But there's just something about being able to connect with your audience that really makes the show worthwhile. And if you can't do that, then it almost seems like, you know, what's the point? Joy, you said you like um, you like playing the smaller audiences, uh, but one of the bigger things you've played uh, was Lilith Fair, and my understanding is you you won a contest to, to play that. Um, can you tell us about how that came about? Yeah, um, I so there was this contest. This is a website called rstage.com dot com that um, features a lot of. Uh, independent musicians from every every type of genre, and um, I just. I think at the, that time I was just about to release my second album, Rumors, and uh, I submitted the single off of that album, Sweeter, and it hadn't been mixed or mastered yet, but I was just like, I really feel like this song has a lot of potential, and I really um, would love to see if this song could you know, get me into this festival, because it was a contest, and um, you had to get people to vote, and people who were already on that platform who you know listened to music through the website... Um, it was kind of my hope that they would really like the song and um, and vote for it. And um, at that time, Lilith Fair was just coming back. I think it had been dead for about 10 or 13 years or so. And um, for people who don't know, Lilith Fair was started some 20 years ago um, by Sarah McLaughlin. And it's basically a festival that features um, female singer-songwriters, female musicians. Um, so it was this incredible bill with Sarah McLaughlin, um, two of the Dixie Chicks, um, some of my favorite independent artists like Butterfly Bocher, um, had Jill Hennessy, um, who I think more people know her as, um, one of the district attorneys on Law and Order. And, um, just a number of female singer songwriters, Sarah Bareilles, dot, dot, dot. And, um, they toured throughout, I believe it was throughout the United States. I don't know if it was just the Northeast. Um, so I submitted for the Philly market and, um, people voted and I got to open the, the, the festival and, um, it was just like, it was just one of the most incredible experiences that I'd ever had, um, at that point in my life and getting to just meet some people whose music, music I'd listened to as a kid and talk to them about the music industry and what it means to kind of be a female in, in a male dominated industry and what it means to kind of do that full time and what it might look like in the future. So, um, that was a really cool experience, and um, I actually got to do that event with my band. So um, that was just uh, it's just a great a great day for us. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time for us to head to break, but before we go to break, we're going to hear a song off of your new album, which is what we're going to focus on in the second half of the show. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to the song we're about to hear? Yeah, this is a song called No Matter What, and... Um, this is kind of the album itself is about relationships. There's a lot of relationship songs on it. And so, um, it's basically about that push and pull of, um, what it means to like give of yourself. And, it, and sometimes in many cases you don't get back, you know, and you might be on the giving end for some time and on other, and other times you might be on the receiving end. So here we go. We'll see you right after the break. Shadow, but you need 
someone to love you like I do. No matter what you say, I'm gonna love you anyway. Starting to think that I'm shallow But you need someone You need someone You need someone To love you like I do Oh oh David, what have you got there? Uh, a pina colada? No, not the drink. Oh, this. Yeah, I've been meaning to tell you about this. We just got our shipment of 3x10 bumper stickers in. Oh, sweet. Now I can put one on my car and pick up chicks. Uh, Keith, you're married. Whoa, it's working already. Well, if you want a chick magnet Lancast bumper sticker like Keith, they're free. Just email us at bumpersticker at thelancast.com. Hey, Keith, get back here with the box of stickers. I need one for my car. Welcome back. We're talking with Joy Ike. Uh, she's back on the show to talk about her third album, All or Nothing, releasing very shortly here. Um, let's talk a little bit about why, what's different about this album from the other one. It's been, it's been roughly three years since Rumors, which was when you were on before, right around the release of that. So how have you grown your, the songs that you're, you've recorded on this album? Oh, there's so much that's different about this album. Uh, I don't even, I really feel like I don't even know where to start. Uh, the songs have been around, I think, a lot longer than songs that I've written for past albums. You know, they've kind of been there and existed waiting just to be recorded. Whereas for other albums, you know, as soon as the songs were done, I was ready to go into the studio. Um, but this one, I, um, I just, there was so much that I wanted for this album that I really needed to sit on it and wait for um, the right people to work with, as in a, a producer to work with. Um, so I was kind of shopping around for um, someone who understood my type of music and had worked with other artists that I had worked with, um, that other artists that I listened to and like um, and knew kind of where I was coming from or the vision I had for this album and could kind of help me make it happen. So uh, it really just required sitting and waiting just for the right time and the right person to work with. So let's, let's talk about band wise. Did you add things in that you hadn't thought of before? I think uh, for rumors, didn't you go to churches to record like special pianos or something for that? 
Hmm. That album feels like it was so far away and so long ago. Uh, for the last album, yeah, I think I we tracked piano at um, a church in Pittsburgh. This time we tracked piano at a friend's a friend's house. He had a this beautiful like Yamaha grand piano in his living room and uh, let us use it. We just camped out there for about three days um, and recorded the piano for it. Um, similar to Rumors, this al- the, the album is full instrumentation, so it's got the core of our band, which is um, piano, upright bass, and uh, percussion. Um, and one of my favorite things uh, uh, is, or our strings. I love strings so much, and um, that's kind of a constant thing that keeps, keeps weaving itself through all the albums. Um, but there's something about this album, I think, not just the songwriting and not just the um, the music and the arrangements, but the instrumentation is just so much fuller and so, uh, so much more lush that I feel like... Um, every aspect of the album has kind of come together to make it what it is and to make it strong and just a really strong piece of art that I'm just really proud of. And, um, and so I don't know, I'm just excited for what's to come with it. When you, when you write a song with the, with the full band, um, do you have a picture in your mind of how you want the, the whole song to pan out and sound? Or do you kind of show the band, this is the song I wrote and let them kind of add their parts to it? Um, it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, usually I'll write a song, um, most likely on the piano, and I'll start to hear things. Um, and most times I really don't know what it's going to ultimately be. But um, I always hear drums all the time. Like I already have an idea of what's happening with the drums. And at the same time, uh, the guys I'm working with, um, Jason Raffalak on upright bass and Ryan Socrates, on uh, percussion, I think we've just been playing together uh, now for a while that we kind of get an idea of what what do these songs look, what's the personality of these songs as a whole, you know, what's this, what's quote unquote joy style, and so what can we lend to it to make it sound like it is joy style, but to still make it its own unique song. So um, it's a little bit of both, you know, everyone kind of puts their heads together to see what happens. Well, when, when constructing something like that with a full band, is there a part of you that thinks, what do I have to do so I don't lose the ability to perform this the way I want by myself? Um, well, the songs, I always write the songs on my own. Like I always, and sometimes that can be a couple weeks, sometimes it'll take a couple months to write a song, um, and I'll just let it sit until I feel like it's a good standalone song. So it isn't until the song is fully written and fully um, established in its arrangement that I take it to the band and then ask them to kind of help with their input. And then every once in a while it'll change in its shape a little bit, um, but I always make sure the song can stand alone Um, by itself as a piano song or as a ukulele song so that whenever um, I'm on the road and I'm playing acoustic shows that it still works out. Yeah, it's always a uh, a big issue with full bands playing. If the song's written as a full band going back down to a yeah to an acoustic show, it's kind of like, oh, the song really hinges on that guitar part yeah. that's not here anymore yeah. you know and i will say there are some songs where i tend to opt out of playing them at shows if i feel like they do lose a lot uh, without um drums especially like i feel like drums uh can be the foundation of so many of my songs and i think that also comes um from my nigerian background you know i just uh, around percussion all the time and feel like it's just so vital to the life of these songs that there are, c- are certain songs where i'm just like mm, just doesn't feel right without that percussion element. So, um, yeah, I think it just depends. Depends on the setting. It could even depend on how comfortable I am with the audience, you know, to give it a try solo. Mm -hmm. But earlier in the first half, you mentioned that uh, this album was very much about relationships. Mm -hmm. So give me an idea of, like, what kind of journey, listening from beginning to end, this this album takes you through. Like, what kind of relationship patterns or feelings? Oh, that's a hard question. (laughs) Um, Well, the album, where to start and where to end. So the album is called All or Nothing. And um, my sister and I were like, we were listening to these songs and we were just like, what is like, what's the common theme? um, And what could we possibly name the album to kind of like sum it up? You know, that would actually, if people listen to the album, they could be like, yeah, that does make sense that she called it All or Nothing. And there was this like running theme through a lot of the songs about what it means to like give your all, 
and no matter what you're doing, whether it's relationships or what it is you do for a living or just in living life to the fullest. So that theme kind of runs itself through so many songs. Um, and I think there, there are just a number of songs about, um, loving and loving wholeheartedly and giving everything you have, um, whenever you don't have anything more to give. Um, and then on the, on the flip side, there are songs about, you know, what's it mean just to be honest and lay it all on the line because you have nothing else to lose at that point, you know? So there are these, like, there's these very, there are these very, like, um, to me, they, I feel like they're just these heart wrenching songs about being honest, you know, about a relationship, um, because, because you can, you know, not because it's easy, but because you can and you should be. And, um, and for me, sometimes, I mean, they always say that whatever you do, whatever your art is, it's kind of your therapy. <laughs> it's kind of the way you, you avoid having to go and sit on that couch, you know, in the psych psychiatrist's office. So for me, it's like my outlet, you know, and, and that was kind of my way of venting, I think, to a certain extent. So some people sit in their cars and, and talk to themselves as if they're arguing with a person. And I just write songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's the, the, is there a specific, you, the order you put these in, do they have a specific, uh, mindset you're taking to people if they listen to the album? I'm just reading the names and it has like the fall song and right after that, pick me up and, <laughs> and don't ever dine in home. It just kind of, uh, I don't know, by, by title, it looks like you're kind of like going yeah. in a direction. I don't know if you intentional do that or if the song's even. No, it really, the songs kind of took their order based on the energy of the songs. Okay. Um, so it is kind of a roller coaster. There's, there are a couple really huge songs to start off, and then there's one that kind of just tone it down and kind of help people reflect um, on the theme of the album, and then it kicks back up again. And the last two songs are just like the most, I call those like the night songs. Like you listen to them when you're taking a long drive at night versus in the morning when you wake up and you need like a pick me up. So, one of the things that I, I, I enjoy about your music is that um, being a faith based person, there is faith-based things in your music but it's not necessarily doesn't really necessarily fit that genre i would say i mean like you don't have it's not pigeonholed mm -hmm. uh, it's relatable to kind of everyone it, it would you find that same theme has been carried over to the new album i i know with um the one of the tracks that you've created a video for like it, it god seems more prominent within the lyrics than um than other songs yeah yeah um it's definitely a theme that's carried over into this new album and is kind of in all all preceding albums and um i i keep going back and forth whenever i have uh, conversations with people you know i always say you know i don't um i don't want to be pigeonholed into um the christian music industry you know and i think the more that happens um in uh the Christian media setting, you know, as, as, as much as I want to be in those places, basically I want to be everywhere I can be and playing for whoever wants to listen, which is just like my heart, you know, I don't want to be pigeonholed in this mainstream culture and I don't want to be pigeonholed in a Christian culture. Um, because what I keep seeing is that the two don't connect like I want them to, you know, like the, they can't kind of keep to their, their own, their own selves. Um, and, that's something that really breaks my heart because I just feel like the church has so much to offer the culture um, and that the church has a lot to learn from the culture, you know? Um, and so I think one of the things that I really try not to do when I'm writing is to write for a specific audience. So um, to write my convictions and to be as upfront about them um, as I can be, because those are what make me who I am. Um, but to Create, create an album that's um, like very comprehensive, you know, that's, it's not like one song is for one people and then one song is for another. And so um, I hope to continue to do that. And I hope that that's something that people, um, you know, see and accept. And um, I think that's just kind of what makes my music what it is. So Joy, you brought your uh, little ukulele here with you and you're going to play a song live for us. Uh, song happy from your new album could you tell us uh introduce that song to us a little bit before you play it yeah um so i wrote this song in 2011 and i just uh just come home from being on the road for like three months um 
on and off over that that three months I was in and out and on the road and I got home and I was just so I was so done and so over music like I was just like I can't do this anymore and it's not fun I don't enjoy it um, and it's just depleting me of like all the life and energy that I have and um, so I just basically hit a wall and um, at that time I started thinking a lot about my parents and um, everything they did to come over um, to the United States you know get an education um, and kind of put us through school and, you know, just make a life for themselves and put us, you know, just make a life for myself and my siblings. And um, I started to really identify with them and this whole like nomadic lifestyle that I've been living for the last four and a half years and started to see, you know, my parents, you know, to a certain extent, they were nomads. They came to the United States. They didn't know anyone, but they paved a way for themselves. And um, so I just, uh, started reflecting on that and thinking about what is it that I want to do with my life? You know, what do I feel is purposeful? Do I feel like this music um, has purpose? You know, do I feel like it's worth investing all my time and my life to it? Um, and the answer I ended up on was yes. You know, I feel like this is what God has called me to do in my life. You know, I feel like he's gifted me in this and I feel like I should keep going, you know, because I feel like um, eventually that dam will break, you know. And, um, and so that's kind of how this whole song came about. And, um, it, it's, it's almost the song that defines the album, you know, that whole all or nothing mentality of doing whatever you can as best as you can. So here's happy. Two, three, four. Finally had some time to sit around and settle down and think about my life I must admit I don't know what comes next, what to expect But want to get it right, I just want to be happy Happy with me, oh, 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 oh. Thirty-five some years ago, you left your world to make a new home in this new place. Yeah, Dad and Mom, you sure are brave to let it all go and pave your own way. So I hope you happy, happy with me. Oh, 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 oh. oh, oh. Oh, oh. Ooh. when I'm gone and my life is done and I've spent my love and sung my last song, I wanna be eulogy like she was sweet and she was strong and she never marched to anybody else's drum and I, 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 I hope that they will say that she walked like Jesus and she talked like Jesus and she lived like Jesus and she loved like Jesus and I made him happy happy I made him happy I made him happy I made him happy happy With me, oh, 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 Well, Joy, what's next? This album is, you know, we're right at the release here, and uh, you've got a concert here in town in about a week from from the air of this show. What's What are you going to be doing in the next year? Uh, well, in the next year, uh, I have a publicist that I've been working with, and um, our primary job has been to um, get the album out to as many media outlets as possible, um, to... Um, put it in front of new people, you know, new ears that uh, wouldn't hear it otherwise. Um, my goal primarily is um, to be booking 
more universities. Um, I just feel like students, I've, I've had a great time connecting with students over the last several years. Um, to be playing more for um, students, um, to be playing really anywhere, anywhere and everywhere. Um, and we're working on uh, music licensing as well, so working on getting the songs in different uh, mediums, um, television, shows, different things like that. Um, but the goal has always just been to get it in, in front of as many ears as possible. Um, and so my hope is that by the end of the year there will be some um, new traction, you know, and I, I hope to look back on 2013 and be like, wow, you know, we've come so far with um, all the work we've put in, you know, with this album, both in the studio and touring it. And what about the upcoming concert here? Let's uh, get a little information on that in case anybody wants to check you out on a new album. Yeah, um, so myself and my band will be here on Sunday, March 3rd, and we're going to be playing at the YWCA. Um, and Nick Francis and Benjamin Bachman of Mosaic helped to put the show together, so they're going to be helping to uh, make it happen. And we're just really excited to be uh, playing for the Lancaster audience and WJTL has been really supportive and has been playing the music on the air for the last couple weeks or so. But um, I've just done so much uh, solo and duo acoustic traveling that it's just really exciting to be able to do a couple of days on the road with my band and to bring them uh, the full sound that they'll hear on the album. If someone really wants to just find more of your music and find out more about you, um, where can they go to do that? Um, they can go to joyike.com, J-O-Y-I-K-E, and um, I always tell people I'm probably on any, any and every social network you've ever heard of, <laughs> but if you go to joyike.com, you'll be able to find me in those other mediums. But um, I, uh, the album is available on iTunes and Amazon, uh, Google Play, and all of the above, so... Um, I definitely hope people visit me at joyek.com. I just started this really cool blog called 365 Days of All or Nothing. Um, and I'm not sure what I got myself into, <laughs> but it's a daily blog um, about anything and everything that um, is related to an all or nothing mentality. So it's, uh, I'm not getting much sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks again, Joy, for coming back on the show and just kind of sharing about all your progress. It's thanks been great. for having me. This is great. We hope you've been enjoying the Lancast. This episode was produced by myself, David Moulton, with show notes by Keith and Lawrence Lesser. All pertinent links to this episode can be found in the show notes at thelancast.com. If you specifically like this episode, we ask that you consider making a donation. Every little bit helps. Even a dollar a show can keep us going. If you'd like to help support us, you can do so by going to thelancast.com slash donate. And don't forget to subscribe in iTunes and tell a friend about the show. So for The Lancast, I'm David Moulton. And I'm Keith Slesser. Asking, are you in the cast? Things to know about Joy. She apparently <laughs> breathes hummingbirds yeah. into yeah, life. She actually, her, right? her mouth is actually is a hummingbird. Yeah, right? well, that's what they created what in the shape of this mold. Yeah. She puts yeah. food in there and then out comes and then the, out comes the hummingbird. The hummingbird wow. As you can that's, see here, yeah, that's pretty, she releases them to the wild. But cool. then over here, she also like she, she also drops hearts like all over the place. When, when she cuts her thumb, hearts actually come out. Yeah. It's not blood. Life, it's life, 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 life blood. Life blood yeah. comes out of Yeah, her. exactly. <laughs> so that's what I've learned from this album. Wow. <laughs> cool. So how many of these songs are dedicated to me? <laughs> all but one. <laughs> what? <laughs>